Welcome to our ladies' Bible study again this evening, ladies. It's good to have all of you with us. We're continuing with this third Bible study in our special lockdown series on Philippians chapter 1. If you have your Bibles with you, turn now to the book of Philippians. And I'd like to encourage you to take some time to read through the whole book when you have a moment. It really is a blessing. Let's just open our time together in prayer and let's commit our time to the Lord. Father, thank you so much that this evening we can gather together again around your precious word. And Lord, I pray that this evening again we will be reminded of the fact that when we open your word, it is not a dead book. But Lord, that it is you yourself that speaks to us. I pray, Lord Jesus, that that will be the case this evening. I pray, Lord, that as we look at your word as we study your word together that your holy spirit will come and do the miraculous work within us to give us insight into your word to change our hearts through your word and lord that as our lives are changed we may be able to live more and more in a way that glorifies you i pray this evening lord that you would take your word and bless it to our hearts. For I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're busy looking at Philippians chapter 1 in this special lockdown series. And tonight, we've come to Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. And in Philippians 1, 3 to 4, Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Now we've seen that Philippians is the epistle or the letter of joy. And right at the outside set here, Paul speaks of his joy. He says, I always pray with joy. Paul had learned the secret of true joy and contentment. And yet he was a prisoner in Rome. He was facing possible death by execution. And remember, we saw last time that 10 to 12 years earlier, Paul and Silas had in fact been in prison with their feet in the stocks after receiving a brutal beating, and yet they were singing. Now, the last two words of chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul repeats this again. He says again, I rejoice. This theme of rejoicing or joy occurs 16 times in the somewhat 104 verses of this little letter. Over and over again in this one short letter, every Christian is being urged to rejoice. It really weaves its way right through this letter like a, like a golden thread, if you like. But the verse that must surely be the greatest climax and one of the most well-known verses of the entire letter on the subject of joy is Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, rejoice. How did Paul arrive at this outlook? What secret had he learned that we may also learn so that we are able to rejoice, to have joy in our presence? Tonight I want us to look a little more closer at this matter of true joy. And I want to do so, not from chapter 1 tonight, but from chapter 4 and verse 4, from this well-known verse in chapter 4. Now remember, it seems as though these Philippian Christians had experienced some kind of opposition and suffering because of their faith. And because of this, because of these trials, it may be that the notes of joy and rejoicing that had once been ringing in the congregation had begun to die down. And so Paul needed to remind them of the centrality of Christian joy. And so we need to see tonight that joy is the universal mark of a Christian. Now everyone wants joy in life. On the surface, Paul's words, rejoicing the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Well, on the surface, they're pretty simple. 
They're easy to understand. But when you scratch beneath the surface, they raise a pile of questions, don't they? Is it really possible to rejoice always? And what does it mean? Am I supposed to go around with a perpetual grin on my face? Is it a sin to feel depressed or sad? Am I supposed to deny pain and sorrow? How can you command a feeling anyway? Because this is a command. Rejoice in the Lord. Are these the words of a bubbly, incurable optimist? What is this? In fact, maybe just reading this verse this evening might get you discouraged and might, might lead you into despair. And it can be a very discouraging experience for, the, for you to get depressed while I'm talking about Christian joy tonight. So I hope that that won't be the effect of our study together. Now, one of Paul's greatest concerns for the church in Philippi was for spiritual stability. And you'll see that if you read through the book. In chapter 1 and verse 27, Paul says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man, for the faith of the gospel. Then again, if you look at chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. So that's what the Apostle Paul is really after with these Philippian Christians. He wants them to be strong. He wants them to be rooted and grounded. He wants them to be mature, to be courageous, to be bold, to be strong as they stand for the Lord in the face of opposition. Well, how are they going to do this? Notice he says there in chapter 4 and verse 1, <clears throat> that is how you should stand firm. Now literally that says, in this way or in this manner, thus, in other words, what he's saying is, here's how I want you to stand firm. Here are the components of a firm life. This is what it takes to be spiritually stable, even though everything is being thrown against you. And when he says, this is what it takes, he's referring not only to what follows in chapter 4, but also to what went before in chapter 3. So, the question that Paul wants to answer for us in the rest of chapter 4 is, what does it take to be strong and firm in the trying times? In the times of great temptation, times of great trial, times of persecution, times of great loss in our families, times of confusion, times of distress and illness. How can we be spiritually strong? How can we have the kind of stability that faces these things without wavering or doubting or sprawling spiritually? How can we have that kind of calm, that kind of contentment and peace in the midst of grave difficulty? Now here in chapter 4 of Philippians, Paul has already spoken in verses 2 and 3 about the importance of spiritual maturity and spiritual unity. Do you remember he speaks about those two women, Yodia and Syntyche? He says in verse 2, I implore Yodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind, of one mind in the Lord. Now, he gives us another principle, another important principle for spiritual maturity and stability. And he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And I say again, rejoice. Let's just start this evening, though, by looking at some of the misunderstandings, the misunderstandings about Christian joy. We need to recognize tonight that what Paul is commanding in this verse is not just a cheerful disposition. 
which you may just have by nature. It is something far deeper. So let's first see what we don't mean by this joy, and then we'll look at a definition of biblical joy. First of all, rejoicing in the Lord does not mean that we are to rejoice only in the Lord and never in His temporal blessings to us. I mean, we can, after all, trace all of God's blessings back to the source, to, to His goodness to us. The Bible tells us to rejoice in the wife of our youth. We, we are to rejoice that we have food on the table, that we have full refrigerators. We can be joyful in the fact that we've been delivered through many trials and dangers and toils and snares. We can be joyful in arriving home safely after a long journey, in healthy newborn babies, in birthdays and feasts, in recoveries from illness. We can be joyful in passing exams and jobs that were attained. But rejoicing for us is gratitude to a living personal God, the God who is the author of these blessings and of 10,000 more. Remember what James chapter 1 verse 17 says? Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So rejoicing in the Lord doesn't mean we never rejoice in His gifts to us. Secondly, rejoicing in the Lord always does not mean that it is wrong for a Christian to ever be uh, uh, sorry, secondly, rejoicing in the Lord is not the same as having fun. It doesn't mean that a church that has plenty of laughter and outward joy is necessarily rejoicing in the Lord, and that a church that is somber and sober and quiet is not rejoicing in the Lord. You see, joy in the Lord is not just fun. It's it's not a short-lived effervescence, you know, like bubbles in a, in a fizzy drink that eventually uh, go flat after a while. So, secondly, rejoicing the Lord is not the same as having fun. Thirdly, rejoicing in the Lord always does not mean that it is wrong for a Christian to ever be sad. It's interesting, and take note of this, that the shortest verse in the Greek New Testament is rejoice always from 1 Thessalonians 5.16 but the shortest verse in the English New Testament is Jesus wept from John 11.35 and ladies they're not contradictory our Lord Jesus our Savior could weep and yet have fullness of joy, even as he faced the cross. He says so in John chapter 15. Paul commands us to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice at the same time. The Bible says that godly people will be marked with a mourning over their sin. And yet they will have irrepressible joy. 1 Peter 1 verse 8, joy inexpressible and full of glory. Surely we can't help but weep when a Christian is murdered for their faithfulness to the Lord Jesus. Surely we should get a lump in our throats when we see the stubborn rebellion of an unsaved person who's on the brink of death. Surely it's right to shed tears because of the many false teachers that are around who live as enemies of the cross of Christ. In fact, Paul has just said that in chapter 3. And verse 18. And surely it is right to sit silent for a whole week before we say one word in the presence of great tragedy, like Job's friends did in Job chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. And Paul's command here does not mean that we must turn every funeral service into a celebration or into a party. There are times when a Christian can howl with pain and a broken heart 
and when such a response glorifies and pleases the Lord. Didn't our Saviour Jesus also weep? We just said so. John 11.35 at the grave of Lazarus. We can rejoice in the Lord even when or even though our hearts are broken. And we can do both to God's glory. Paul says that faithful servants of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 16, are sorrowful yet always rejoicing. So this exhortation, this command here, does not mean that Christians have a permanent grin on their faces. A pleasant expression and a happy face, well that's nice, a welcoming smile certainly helps. But an empty grin, a hypocritical grin, that's not what we're talking about here. Fourthly, rejoicing in the Lord is also not about a certain personality type. So that if you have a kind of jolly personality, well then you can rejoice. But you know, if you don't have jolly personality, well then this command doesn't apply to you and you can't rejoice. Paul is not referring here to a kind of temperament. So what is this joy? Paul, give us a definition of joy. Well, there is very little in the Bible describing the psychology of Christian joy. But there is a lot in Scripture about the fact that true joy is the result of focusing on the Lord it is found as we focus on the character of God by faith. So rejoicing in the scriptures is always spoken of as a byproduct of our relationship with the Lord. That's what Paul says. What does he say? Rejoice in the Lord. So that rejoicing in the Lord is a consequence of knowing and serving and being with the Lord. And that's the difference between joy and happiness. You see, happiness is really just a response to circumstances, while joy is confidence, deep-seated confidence built on a relationship. Now, Dr. John MacArthur defines joy like this. And I want you to take note of it. Maybe even pause the video here and reread the sentence because every word of it is important. Joy is a gift from God to those who believe the gospel of Christ being produced in them by the Holy Spirit because they receive and obey the word of God while experiencing trials and keeping their hope fixed on the glory which is to come. The difference Christianity makes is not to our outward circumstances, but to our inward resources. As one person says, if we look for happiness, we'll never find it. If we keep searching for joy, we'll never attain it. But when our relationship with the Lord is right, when our relationship with Jesus is right, the result will be joy in Him. So joy is a byproduct of our relationship with God. And it is that long sentence of Dr. John MacArthur. And then thirdly, Joy, true joy, is not produced by a bed of roses experience of tranquility and peace and comfort and safety. It is produced by the presence of God and His Holy Spirit, even if you're sitting in prison awaiting possible news about your, your execution, as Paul was. You see, Paul had joy in spite of his circumstances because of his eternal relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit within him. 
He had joy because of his focus on God's goodness and love and faithfulness and holiness and sovereignty and justice and mercy and grace. His joy was in who God is. And so his circumstances were no longer a factor. It is your satisfaction or your trust in God, in who he is and in who he is for you in Christ that will determine the level of our joy. Fourthly, this joy produces a deep confidence in the future built on trust. The relationship says, my times are in God's hands, my life is in God's hands, my life is under Christ's control, and therefore all is well. I can't help but think of that wonderful hymn by Horatio Spafford here, who understood something of this deep-seated joy in spite of very trying circumstances when he wrote the words of that hymn, It is well with my soul. It's the kind of joy that brings a quietness of life because it trusts, because it knows the sovereign God and the faithful Christ will accomplish all their good promise. Let's read Philippians 4 in its context. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Fifthly, this joy comes in union with the Lord. It is not an experience that can be worked up by people called good communicators or by music or by some religious figure putting his hand on your head or by some psychological technique. This kind of joy doesn't come from tongue speaking. That's not what this text is speaking about. This joy stems entirely from the fact that at salvation, every Christian is joined to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. The church, or God's people, are like a branch in Christ who is the true vine. And just like the branches in a, in a vine receive everything they need from the plant, so we daily receive from Jesus, from his fullness, all the life and power and graces that we need to be able to live for him. You see, it is the joy of the Lord that becomes our strength. The Lord Jesus is the source of our joy. But he's also the object of our joy, isn't he? His character, his person, and his, his wonderful work of salvation on our behalf are things we rejoice in. Think about the prophet Habakkuk. He couldn't rejoice much in the state of Judah at the time because the leaders were totally uh, oppressing the poor. They were evil. And why would God allow the wicked to prosper? When was the Lord going to do something about it? Well, God, God told Habakkuk that the Babylonians were going to come and punish Judah. Well, Habakkuk couldn't rejoice in that. I mean, the Babylonians were more wicked than the leaders of Judah. But then God assures him, that whatever the Lord does is right. And that in due time, those Babylonians would also be punished and that justice would be brought for the people of God. 
You see, when Habakkuk looked around him, he saw a people under the judgment of God for their sins. And that wasn't something to rejoice in. But when he looked above his circumstances to the ever-blessed, wise, omnipotent and glorious God, his Savior, then he was able to rejoice. Then he was able to say, Though the fig tree does not blossom, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the store, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be thankful in God, my Savior. And then, just like Paul, he also knew that whatever happened, God had promised his grace would be sufficient for him and he would carry Habakkuk through. And so Habakkuk ends like this. He says, The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. There was a lot around Habakkuk that could have driven him to despair. But as he turned his eyes on the Lord, he was enabled to rejoice anyway. I remember Dr. Rex Matthew always used to say, Hallelujah anyway. I hope you understand now why we have to acknowledge that true spiritual joy is not happiness. Happiness is a state of good fortune and prosperity that's related to or dependent on circumstances, on people or things. So if everything's going well, then I'm happy. But as soon as there's some dark cloud or irritation, then happiness vanishes. Happiness can be a false joy. And since easy circumstances are not the norm in life, as Jesus said, in this world we will have trouble, happiness is actually very elusive. In fact, the Apostle Paul preached this truth. He said in 2 Timothy 3.12, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So that brings us to the sixth point. God's joy is a gift of grace to us. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is given to us as we encounter the hardship and trouble and persecution of life in this world. It is supernatural joy. It is given by God's Spirit to transcend all the conditions of life. We saw that last week. Here are Paul and Silas in prison after receiving a beating and they're singing. As God's children through the new birth, we are able at any time to drink deeply from God's unending stream of joy, regardless of what life offers us. Why? Because God and His character is unchanging. So we can praise God tonight as Christians that our joy is not dependent on circumstances, but on the spiritual realities of God's goodness, God's unconditional love for us, and His ultimate victory over sin and darkness. It is not based on our efforts and our accomplishments or our willpower, but rather on the truth about our relationship with the Father through the Son. It is also not merely an emotion, but it is the result of choosing to look beyond what appears to be true about our life here on earth to what is true about our life in Christ. Let's summarize. So in summary then, our spiritual joy is not an experience that comes from favorable circumstances but it is a sense of well-being that abides in the heart of that person who knows that all is well between himself and the Lord. Now let's have a look at the enemies of joy. 
Because the source of our joy is in God himself, any move towards distrusting or doubting God will then lead to a loss of our joy. You see, whenever things are not well between us and the Lord, joy will be lacking. Now, there are many things that can rob us of our joy. Just a lack of sleep or physical exhaustion can make it very difficult for us to focus on the Lord and then take away our joy. Busyness and overload can do it. And of course, any kind of sin which grieves the Holy Spirit and brings distance in our relationship with the Father will certainly do it. But there are two particularly fierce enemies to our joy that we have to watch out for. The first one is self-pity. Self-pity rears its head when we think that God no longer pities or cares for us. The classic example of this in Scripture is of Elijah in 1 Kings 19. After his amazing victory on Mount Carmel, he runs away from Jezebel into the desert and looking at his circumstances and the seemingly small results of his ministry, he cries out, I, I only am left. He's so full of self-pity, in fact, He's so full of self-pity about the fact that God doesn't seem to have blessed his amazing zeal on Mount Carmel with spectacular results, that he wants God to take his life. He wants to die. You see, Elijah's self-pity grew out of a false basis for security and joy. He was trying to find his happiness, his joy, in success. But you see, even success in the Lord's work is a very shaken, shaky thing to build your joy on. It's a broken reed to lean on for security. Elijah was looking for joy in the wrong place. He was looking for joy in his circumstances, in people and things. He wasn't looking to see what God was doing. The fact that God works as He wills and that He doesn't have to work the way we expect Him or want Him to. God was still going to deal with Jezebel, but it wouldn't be in His lifetime. Our source of joy must be in God, not just in His ways of working. When we look for joy in the wrong place, what it does is it clouds our vision. It blinds us to that, that big perspective, that eternal perspective, which then in turn leads to selfishness, callousness, despair, self-pity. So self-pity is an enemy of joy. But secondly, murmuring or complaining. Griping and murmuring is another enemy of joy. Now ladies, this is not the normal response of just telling how we feel honestly. That's not what I'm talking about here. We all sometimes need a shoulder to cry on. What we're talking about here is when the response goes over into unbelief and grumbling. Like the Israelites in the wilderness. This monster rears its ugly head whenever we feel God is not living up to his promises. This is nothing more or less than unbelief. In fact, it's practical atheism because it ignores God and his character. If we believe that God is wise, then this circumstance will, will be beneficial for me. If he is loving, then it is inconceivable that he would allow this in my life if it wasn't for my good. If he is omnipotent, then there is no power stronger than he is, which means he must be working for me through these circumstances. The Israelites 
were grumbling and complaining and murmuring for food and water in the wilderness in spite of God's provision for them. And the psalmist in Psalm 78 and verses 21 and 22 says this, When the Lord heard them, he was angry. His fire broke out against Jacob, and his wrath rose against Israel, for they did not believe in God or trust in his deliverance. In spite of all this, they kept on sinning. In spite of his wonders, notice, they did not believe. Murmuring is a rebellious ignoring of the prerogatives of God, one commentator says. It makes our heavenly master, our Lord Jesus Christ, seem terribly harsh and unfair. It's like Job. It was Job's problem, even though after glorifying God initially with his initial response to his suffering, remember how he sinned later when he began to accuse God of being unfair for treating him the way he was being treated. And it was only after he saw God in all his majesty and glory again, the majesty of his character, that Job realized how foolish he had been and was able to repent and in dust and ashes. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14, do everything without complaining or arguing. Murmuring is another strong and fierce enemy of joy. There's one more thing that I want us to consider together this evening. What does always mean? You see, if Paul had written rejoice in the Lord, we would all be nodding our heads in agreement. In fact, if Paul had written rejoice in the Lord often, we'd also agree. But the sting in Paul's word is in the choice of the word always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I say it again, rejoice. The great principle here is that whatever our circumstances may be, we are commanded here to rejoice in the Lord and by the help of the Lord, we can. But here again, it's very possible to fall into all kinds of misunderstandings and we can either become critical and simplistic or discouraged. So I just want to clarify for a brief moment what the Bible means here. I believe strongly that there were times in Paul's life when he was unable to rejoice. In other words, I'm saying, I don't think he was always able to obey his own command here. Remember Romans chapter 7? The good he wanted to do, he found himself not being able to do, and the, good, the, the evil he didn't want to do, he found himself doing. So I think often he fell into despondency. Just like all of us. He tells us as much in his letter to the church at Corinth. That there were times when he was pressed down beyond measure. That he despaired even of life itself. And in his heart he felt the sentence of death. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. There were times, 2 Corinthians 4 tells us, when he was perplexed and struck down. He knew his outward man was perishing. And of course, there was that particular occasion when God prescribed for him that thorn in the flesh, which Paul battled to accept joyfully at first. He found it almost impossible to live with this thing, with this future of a thorn in his flesh. And so he turned to the Lord in desperation three times, three extended sessions of prayer to plead with the Lord to remove this thing. That was his initial response. It wasn't a joyful acceptance. But ladies, the Bible tells us that God understands that. Let's just go a step higher. Let's look at the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here he was seeing more clearly than ever before the will of God for him the next day 
looming ahead of him, the cross. He didn't immediately respond, oh great, I'm going to rejoice in this, let's go. We find him as a man agonizing with the terror of what lay ahead for him. Father, can't this cup be removed from me? Now that tells me that God does have a tolerance for this frame of mind. When we also feel like the man Christ Jesus, how frail we are as human beings, how pressed down beyond measure, when we, when we wonder if we're going to survive the ordeal. Psalm 103 tells us that God remembers that we are dust. Now, of course, unlike Jesus, our human weakness and frailty is compounded by our sin. But nevertheless, it's still clear that the suffering and the hardship of our circumstances can't just be brushed off as though they are of no consequences with a kind of blasé, oh well, I better grin and bear it. <laughs> no. The kind of joy that we are speaking of here is something that must be sought. It is not natural. It comes from the Lord as we fight to focus on Him and on His purposes in and through our suffering. Until we can get to the place of saying with Paul, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12. And with the Lord Jesus Christ himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, we can say, not my will, but your will be done. I rejoice to do your will, O God. So what we're saying is that this great commandment that Paul gives us here, that Paul sought to obey, was to rejoice in the Lord always, but he wasn't always able to keep that commandment perfectly any more than you and I can. There were days when because of sin and sometimes the sheer weight of the difficulties that providence had allowed across his paths, he was in the pits, he was in the depths, he was sad, he was despondent. And I'm sure that is something that you and I can both agree on, that, that we've experienced. Even Christ, who was without sin, could as a man feel the weight of an almost unbearable providence and cry out to his Father for the possibility of modifying this destiny of pain. The Bible always keeps these two things together. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And rejoicing the Lord always, therefore means that it is always possible, i.e. at any time or in any circumstances to rejoice in the Lord, that is in God, in His person and character, even though our circumstances may be dreadful. But we must remember that that does not come naturally. And therefore, it will usually mean having to fight for that perspective that leads to joy in God. So let's answer that question. How do I fight for joy? If this joy is something we don't naturally have, and if it will mean fighting for it by faith, how do I fight for joy? That's the subject of a very good book by Dr. John Piper, which I recommend to you, When I Don't Desire God, How to Fight for Joy. If you are talking about growing in the joy of the Lord, you can't bypass the inward life of the soul. In other words, unless you are growing in your knowledge, and I mean just not just intellectual knowledge, but relational knowledge of the Lord, you cannot continue to rejoice in the Lord. Because if joy is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit, then it's nothing. Every joyful Christian is someone who sustains her heart
for the living God. Psalm 43 verse 4, Then will I go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. My Bible says, to God my exceeding joy. And on the harp I will praise you, O God my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Put your hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Think about John chapter 15, the illustration of abiding in the vine in order to have the joy of Jesus. Jesus says, I've told you this, this whole parable of the vine, so that my joy may be in you and so that your joy may be complete. You see, this joy comes in union with the Lord, in fellowship with the Lord. Even in the midst of troubling circumstances, we can offer up a sacrifice of joy by focusing on the only true source of joy, which is God himself. So let me ask you tonight, how are things between you and Jesus tonight? How is your relationship with the Lord Jesus? I'm not asking if you read your Bible I'm not asking if you pray. I'm asking, how is your relationship, your fellowship with Jesus right now? If you find it difficult to find your joy in God at the moment, it may be because you are doubting God's care and goodness, because you have no faith or trust in His care and goodness or the trustworthiness of His promises. And therefore of his person and that often happens ladies when the circumstances are really difficult and heartbreaking I'm not beating you over the head this evening but when you think about it not to trust God not to trust his promises to doubt his character is really blasphemy isn't it because it paints our Heavenly Father as a very bad daddy a daddy who doesn't do what he promises. A daddy that we can't trust. So the way back to joy is to once again meditate on the scripture that bolsters our faith in the person and the character of God, in the immutability or unchangeableness and trustworthiness of his promises. And as you do so, you need to ask the Holy Spirit to come and open your heart Open your eyes to his character through prayer. Read the promises, ask for the Spirit's help. John Piper in his book has a wonderful illustration. He speaks about riding in, in your truck along a road, a dirt road. <clears throat> That's your life. And the circumstances of life are like mud being slung across the windshield of your car. And you can't see, and for a minute you can't see God's glory and His goodness. And your, your life veers off the road and you're in danger of crashing. Well, what do you have to do at that moment? You have to turn on the windshield wipers to remove the mud. And that's like the Word of God, the promises of God. But without the windscreen washer fluid that you need to squirt on as well, which is like the Holy Spirit asking him to, to make those promises real to you and to, to, to give you a vision of God. Without that, the windscreen wipers would just scrape over the hard mud. So we need both. We need the softening work of the washer fluid, the Holy Spirit, to work with the Word of God. And then, as our faith in God is restored, our joy and delight and satisfaction in Him and all that He promises to be for us in Jesus will return, even if our outward circumstances don't change. Elizabeth George, in her book on the fruits of the Holy Spirit called The Woman's Walk with God, uses this illustration. She says, My friend Mary uses God's promises to find joy in her life of chronic illness. She writes, my health problem frequently robs me of joy. 
I often find myself in despair, depression, self-pity, and other fleshly attitudes. This week, when troubled with my affliction, I focused on the Lord. When I pray to see good in my pain, I recall various promises in the scriptures. I was reminded that God is a God of comfort who comforts us in all our afflictions, 2 Corinthians 1.3. It also helped to remember that God is in control and has a unique purpose for this suffering, 2 Timothy 1.9, Ephesians 1.11. That he is using this affliction to work out his will for me, to help me be more Christ-like, for my good and his glory, Romans 8.28. And so I will keep on thanking him for this illness daily, even though I may not fully understand the purpose behind it, says Mary. You see, Mary is learning that God's promises to us are a bottomless reservoir of joy from which we can draw at any moment by simply opening the word and believing his promises. And it's even better if you've memorized a few of those and have them hidden in your heart. If joy flows from being satisfied with all that God promises to be for us in Jesus, then the promises lead us inevitably to the God of the promises. So we need to go to God to be filled with His joy whenever we need it. And the way to do that is to make use of His means of grace that He's put to our disposal. The Bible, prayer, church fellowship and oh lord please speed the day when we can gather together again as god's people the lord's table books good christian books and music oh music don't forget good christian music with good solid lyrics and that's where the fight comes in use these means to bolster your joy and your faith in god what does Psalm 1 say? Blessed, happy, truly joyful is the woman who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law she meditates day and night. She is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither and whatever she does prospers. Now I want to close tonight by leaving you with a few illustrations of joy. Images of joy that will maybe make a concrete picture for you of what we're talking about here. The first one is a picture of a stream. Think about a little stream, a little bubbling brook flowing along with that pleasant, refreshing sound. You can almost hear it. But what causes that sweet sound to come from that little bubbling brook. Isn't it the piles of large jagged rocks and boulders that impede the water's surface, even redirecting its path? This is what causes the little stream to give out those utter, utterly joyful sounds. It's amazing that something so traumatic can produce something so lovely. And yet, isn't this stream a picture of what real life is like? Or at least what the Christian life should be like? Our lives are filled with disappointments and crises and tragedies and heartaches and afflictions and struggles, just as Jesus said there would be. But the good news is that as we encounter these disquieting rocks that impede our progress and these boulders that disturb our tranquility, that break the surface, that redirect our paths. God can give us real joy to produce songs of praise to him. Then there's a picture of the diamond against a dark background or a black cloth. When a diamond is placed against a dark background, the darkness makes it look even more brilliant, doesn't it? And when you lift that diamond to the light, all the facets of the diamond are, are revealed and allowed to sparkle. Now, a diamond is pretty in, in and of itself, but when you put it against a black background, a 
and you lift it up to the light, it enhances its radiance and its glory. What a perfect picture of joy. True spiritual joy shines brightest against the darkness of trials and tragedy and testing. In fact, the blacker the background, the greater the brilliance. And similarly, life's dark struggles make Christian joy more intense and our heartfelt praise more glorious. And then the world can see that it's true joy, supernatural joy from God. A last image that I'd like to leave you with is one that I got from Susanna Spurgeon, the wife of C.H. Spurgeon. Now she suffered from physical disabilities that grew progressively worse year by year. And finally, it reached the point where she could no longer travel with her husband whenever he went across the Atlantic to America and other places to preach. And she'd have to endure her painful affliction all on her own without his presence for six to nine months at a time. Listen to what she wrote one dark, cold, lonely evening as she sat alone beside her fire. The fire was letting loose the imprisoned music from the old oak's inmost part. As the fierce tongues of the flames came to consume the log's hardened callousness, the fire wrung from him a song and a sacrifice. Oh, thought I, when the fire of affliction draws songs of praise from us, then indeed our God is glorified. We would give forth no melodious sounds were it not for the fire which is kindled round us that releases the tender notes of trust in him. Singing in the fire, let the furnace be heated seven times hotter than before, she says. Ladies, we don't get to choose the song. We didn't write it. God did. We simply get to choose whether or not to sing. And how comforting it is tonight to know that the one who wrote the song is always meticulously, meticulously writing the perfect lyrics. So in conclusion, F. B. Mayer wrote, The joy of the Lord arises from leaving all our burdens at His feet, from believing that He has forgiven the past as absolutely as the time obliterates children's writing in the sand, that nothing can come which He does not either appoint or permit, that He is doing all things as wisely and as kindly as possible, that in him we have been lifted out of the realm of sin, sorrow and death and into the realm of divine light and love and that we've already commenced the eternal life that will be before us forever now and that there is a fellowship with him so rapturous and exalting that human language can only describe it as unspeakable. We may not be able to rejoice in anything about our circumstances. That would be hypocritical. But we can always rejoice that Jesus Christ lives and intercedes for us and that he has promised to save us to the uttermost. That he never forgets us for a single moment because our names are indelibly written on his hands and in his heart that he has prepared a place for us and soon he will come to take us to be with him in paradise where all our questions will be answered, where every unexplained difficulty will be explained to our eternal comfort. And until then, he promises, he's the vine. He will supply all our needs by his abounding grace. He will accomplish his will for us, in, for us and in us that we can persevere through him until the end because Philippians 1 6 he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ 
Our rejoicing is in his immeasurable grace and love to us in Jesus Christ. In other words, in the eternal and everlasting truths of the gospel, focused on the Lord Jesus himself. That's what we rejoice in. And we need those truths constantly to come to us afresh. We need our eyes to be open to them again and again and again to see what a great reality it is to be in the Lord. So ladies, fix your eyes on Jesus. Jesus only. Let nothing eclipse his glory from your vision. Meditate on him and all that he has promised to be for you and all that you are in him and your joy will be full. Even if you have tears streaming down your face and even if your heart is breaking. Like Corey Ten Boom, I've been listening to and watching a couple of messages by her in recent days. Let me read to you something that she said. The source of our strength is Jesus Christ himself. And his cross shows us that we can accept suffering with joy as a part of God's plan with this world. When I was in concentration camp, one of the most terrible things that I had to go through was that they stripped us of all our clothing and we had to stand naked before those guards. The first time it happened was the worst. I said, oh Betsy, I can't bear this. This is worse than all the other cruelties. And then suddenly she says, it was as if I saw Jesus at the cross. And the Bible tells us that he took his garment, they took his garments and that he had to hang there naked. And then I knew. He hung there for me, for my sins. And by my suffering, says Corey, I understood a fraction of the suffering of Jesus Christ for me. And that made me so thankful that I could bear my suffering for him. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. She says, in that prison, I could experience the joy of the Lord because I got more intimately acquainted with him. And when you come to him, he will give you his joy. And the joy of the Lord is your strength. Ladies, that same Jesus and that same joy is available to everyone who will rejoice in him. Listening, closing to the words of Philippians 4 verses 4 to 7, but from the Philip's translation. Delight yourselves in God. Yes, find your joy in him at all times. Have a reputation for gentleness and never forget the nearness of your Lord. Don't worry over anything whatsoever. Tell God every detail of your needs in earnest and thankful prayer. And the peace of God, which transcends human understanding, will keep constant God over your hearts and minds as they rest in Christ Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15. 13. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I've said a lot tonight, but I pray that you will please be gracious to us and that you will come and be 
the after speaker of your word to our hearts tonight. Lord Jesus, we want your joy. We want to be good ambassadors of our Heavenly Father, our loving Heavenly Father. We want to trust you. We want to keep our hope in you. And we want to be filled with joy. Help us to fight for that joy, even in those times, Lord, when tears are streaming down our faces, when our circumstances are so overwhelming that we despair even of life itself. Help us to find the miracle, the supernatural miracle of joy in you, in spite of our circumstances. I pray tonight, Lord, for any who may be watching this, who are going through the valley of the shadow of death, who are sitting watching this, Lord, with tears streaming down their faces, who are finding it very difficult to rejoice in your purposes for them. I pray that you'll come and do that miracle for them tonight again, Lord. Show them your glory, I pray. Show them the glory of your grace and of what it means to be in union with Jesus Christ. And lift their eyes above their circumstances tonight, Lord, and please give them your joy. I ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, for his sake. Amen.